This episode of the HVAC School Podcast is made possible by our fantastic sponsors, starting with Fieldpiece at fieldpiece.com, making all kinds of instruments and vacuum pumps and recovery machines and all kinds of great stuff. I'm sure you know Fieldpiece, but it may have slipped my mind. I may have never mentioned to you that my first meter in the trade was a Fieldpiece meter. So there you go. First meter in the trade, Fieldpiece meter. In fact, I still have a Fieldpiece Multimeter in my van right now. I've used Fieldpiece for many years, and I especially like the VP85 and MR45 vacuum pumps and recovery machines. Also, AeroOasis at AeroOasis.com. Navac, NavacGlobal.com, makers of all kinds of stuff, all kinds of interesting tools for the HVAC industry. If you haven't looked at Navac yet, I would encourage you to go to TrueTechTools.com, take a look at the Navac tools, and you can always get an 8% discount by using the offer code GETSCHOOLED. Also, Refrigeration Technologies at RefrigeTech.com. They make the Viper Cleaners. And one thing that I love about Viper Cleaners is that they do the job but without nasty chemicals. You can tell first time you use Viper that it just doesn't have that nasty punch that some of the other chemicals have. And if you get a little bit of it on you for most of the products, it's not going to be nearly as damaging as what a lot of the other competitors have out there. So find out more by going to RefrigeTech.com. And then finally... Our longest sponsor, the sponsor who stuck with us from the very beginning and really, truly made this podcast possible all the way from the start, Carrier and Carrier.com. Every man hits a certain stage in life, a stage where they become more serious. This guy blew right past that stage, straight to old man dad humor, Brian Orr. All right, Haiti Heidi Hody. I probably overdo the Haiti Heidi Hody thing. That's sort of become my tagline to start the podcast. This is Brian. It's the HVAC School Podcast. Thanks for listening. This is the podcast that helps you remember some things that you might have forgotten along the way. Oh, and by the way, it also helps you remember some things you forgot to know in the first place. And today on the podcast, I've got Bill Spohn, who's been on the podcast many times. Very good friend. Very good man. Bill is a good man. I'm proud to call him a friend, as I mention often. And today on the podcast, we're going to talk about different combustion tools, gas tools, combustion tools, and so that you can kind of have a perspective on what tool you might want to have on your truck. You'll know a little bit more about calibration, what that's all about, and how to think about different tools and where they fit in the whole gas appliance diagnosis spectrum of things. And so this is one that we haven't done before, so I think you'll enjoy it. Here we go. Bill Spohn talking about combustion tools. Thanks for joining me, Bill. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate you inviting me on today to talk a little about what I think I know about. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to hear that my expert thinks he knows something about the topic we're going to talk about. But in all honesty, there's two things when I think about Bill Spohn. I mean, there's a lot of things that I think about Bill Spohn, and they're all good. But the two things that I think about from an expertise standpoint are airflow or air measurement in general. So air measurement, I always think of you as kind of the expert in that area. And then also combustion. And so am I right to think of you in that way? I'll just preface it by saying my definition of an expert is someone who's made sufficient enough mistakes in an area to consider themselves an expert. And that just goes along with the idea of continuous learning. I'll accept those titles, I'll say amongst the experts, but I will say that my expertise is more limited to the understanding of the sensors and the technology there may be others out there who have more experience to understand the applications of these things, and I'm always interested in learning from them. I do airflow seminars every year for a couple different organizations or a couple different trade shows, the Home Performance Conference and the ResNet, the Raiders Conference. And each year I submit a proposal and I call it Airflow 2016, Airflow 2017, Airflow 2018, et cetera. And I'm doing Airflow 2019 at both conferences next year because it's always evolving. My understanding's evolving. It's not the same static content. Some of the products evolve, but also my understanding is some of the testing that's done. So we'll go with that with Airflow. And on the combustion side, I've Worked with Bacharach for 10 years in product development, have three patents with them. So I studied with some of the people that sort of brought forth digital or electronic combustion analyzers, the folks at Bacharach. So that's studied with them, worked with them, worked on products there, then worked with Testo, uh, an international authority on measurement science, on measurement products, got to learn from them and their great development team. So I feel like I have had a lot of experience, very unique experiences, put it that way, to help qualify me in the terms of an expert for today's conversation. 
All right, so we've established it now. Quickly, before we go any further, I want to mention, for those of you who may not know, that Bill is the host of the Building HVAC Science podcast, which is on the Blue Collar Roots Network. It's a great podcast. He's a great host. The guy who edits the show, eh, maybe not so good. But Bill does a great job with that show. Speak for yourself. Yeah, speak for myself. Or you were. I brought Bill on today because we've talked quite a bit about combustion recently. We had Jim on and talked a lot about the practical applications. We kind of talked through the new AccuTools Combustion Quick Start Guide that Jim wrote. But sort of missing in that was a conversation about the instruments themselves. And that's an area that I really think you're an expert on, obviously, having helped to develop some of these products and understanding the engineering side, but then also having to support those day in, day out at True Tech Tools, truetechtools.com, offer code get schooled for a great discount on combustion analysis equipment. So I want to go through kind of step by step and talk through some of the different instruments that are used and particularly talk about how to choose these instruments, and then some of maybe the things that we don't think about, like calibration and that sort of thing. I'm just going to go through and ask you about different instruments, and we'll do it that way if that's okay with you. That's perfectly fine. All right, so one of the first instruments that a technician who works with gas probably touches is a manometer. Some of you may have a gas pressure gauge that's sort of an old-school manual analog way or maybe even an incline manometer, but we're going to talk specifically about digital manometers here. So for a technician who's going to be working with gas, the full range of typical residential light commercial gas appliances, water heating, 80% all the way through 90 plus appliances, what should they look for in a manometer? What are some things they should know? It should always start with the application. And you hinted towards that there. You need to understand what your targets are to measure. And that's something Jim talks about a lot. And I learned from him is you need to know what you're after. And in addition to the target value that you're after, so that helps specify the range in the meter, you need to know the resolution or what's the acceptable accuracy or a resolution that you're going to see on the screen to help you make the decision to complete your diagnostic or your setup, whichever the case may be. And usually things like a combustion analyzer, we're talking more specifically about that, the manometers that are built into them are sufficient for measuring gas pressure and for measuring flue pressures or draft, if you will. And then the standalone manometers can do that. Also, generally the ones that we carry at TrueTech and elsewhere, there are some specialty manometers that will take you into finer resolution for measuring things like room pressures, zonal pressures, combustion air zone pressures and depressurization, which I think Jim did get into a little bit in his podcast with you and in the AccuTools Blue Flame checklist there. Specifically on a manometer, if I'm a regular technician and I'm primarily going to be using my manometer for two things, I think most common uses would be one for measuring gas pressure, so natural gas and LP, and then I'm also going to be measuring static pressure with it. Are there any particular products out there that you like or you think maybe a technician should consider for that application? I really like the ones that are coming out that are Bluetooth. And the reason for that is actually they cost less because you're basically, a lot of these Bluetooth products, you're buying what I call radio sensors. They just deliver data. They deliver a stream of data. And then you can do all kinds of things in data with the other end. So something like the Testo 510i delivers a stream of pressure data, and then that can be converted into different units of measure within the app you can then data log it and look for changes. You can snapshot readings, you can get tables of values. And then again, it sounds like I'm plugging this, but I guess I am. Measure Quick allows you to merge and to aggregate several streams of data, or shortly will, on a live stream. It probably by the time you listen to this, I hope it's available, that you could take these relatively inexpensive sub $100 extra high performance manometers and then do all kinds of things with them on the output end through the apps. So I think that's the thing that's liberating about the Bluetooth sensors. For some people, that's not their piece of cake. That's fine. So you have digital manometers from UEI, from Fieldpiece, from Testo that have displays built into them. There are some brands out there that also have Bluetooth, so you can do that extra data step with them. But the fact that you merge a display, an interface, controls, all those kind of things into a product has to increase its cost because you're getting more utility in the thing you put in your hand versus the radio sensor and the Bluetooth item. So the other thing to pay attention to is temperature compensation that will throw off a manometer because they are reading in such fine ranges. So you have to be aware of, and I wouldn't call it a a temperature problem, but they do need time to readjust because they're measuring such small uh, mechanical forces, really pressure is a mechanical force, 
that the sensors inside need to have a stable temperature readings on them, a stable temperature environment to work with them. And then from there, just make sure that it's warmed up and ready to go when you apply it for your diagnostic. I want to add a little commentary here, which is that for the standard use case, which is measuring gas pressure, both inlet and then output of your gas valve, essentially, uh, manifold pressure, your inlet pressure, for those applications, I'm definitely going to suggest that you move away, and again, one man's opinion, but move away from the analog gas pressure gauges or on the static pressure side from the magna helic, unless you have some specific reason for wanting those devices, because you can do both of those use cases with these modern digital manometers. And the price point on them is to the point now where it really just doesn't make a lot of sense to use an analog gauge. That's my opinion. Do you think there are applications where somebody might still want to use an analog gauge for that use case? Perhaps in the instance that you want to continually measure and just like hook up a magnahelic, screw it down to the sheet metal, hook up the hoses and be able to just glance at it, maybe for some larger commercial application. But in the moment diagnostic, I think the digitals make more sense. There's also things like incline manometers, slack tube manometers that actually do use water or other kinds of chemicals to give you sort of the physical attribute of that pressure change to be able to see it visually. And then the analog ones with the fact that you have a mechanical movement and position sensitivity. I mean, they come with their own quote unquote downsides to doing that. I, I never try to discourage people from making any kind of measurement. <laughs> so I, I am measurement neutral as long as you're making one. And as long as you're making the right one using the right tool for the job. I mean, that's another consideration. So from a calibration standpoint, with each one of these tools we talk about, I'm going to kind of ask you two different categories of question about calibration, and you can take this any direction you want. The, the one question is, how do you know if you're getting an accurate reading? And then secondly, are there any requirements typically for having these lab calibrated or sending it back in for calibration? So on the manometer side, what, what are your thoughts there? On the manometer side, usually the calibrations are done on the digital ones. They're done digitally or electronically, and they're not a typical adjustment that I've seen that are made. In fact, at TrueTech, we do calibrations from the gas parameters, and you can actually do some of the temperature parameters and some of the products, but not so much on the pressure side. The offsets and the scalings there are sort of restricted or hidden from the user. I believe that's because the stability of the sensors there, as long as you don't overrange it, they don't usually go out of whack. The ability to start it up and to zero it to make sure that there's no pressure difference between the two ports on a differential manometer gives you the zero point. And then the scaling, as long as you haven't overloaded it, the scaling is pretty much hard programmed in for more or less the life of the sensor. In some situations, if you do want to compare it, I think actually going back to something like an incline manometer with the proper technique, you could use that because that does give you pretty fine resolution. If people aren't familiar with an incline manometer, it's basically a hunk of lexan or polycarbonate that has bored out passageways in it, and it's filled with a red liquid that responds to pressure changes across that liquid, and it moves it up or down a ramp, and then you have to use your line of sight and look at the meniscus against the scale behind it to see what the pressure change is. Okay, got it. So from a practical standpoint, I'm thinking what I'm hearing from you is manometers tend to be pretty accurate and pretty stable. Yeah. So generally, you can trust your manometer. If you suspect that maybe it's not working properly, then probably your best bet is just to check it against another manometer. Because the odds that you have two manometers that are out of calibration is going to be pretty rare. And then there's not generally going to be a calibration requirement. Essentially, if it gets to the point that you can't trust it anymore, then you just toss it and get another one. Yeah. And actually, I would compare it to three. Three is a better discernment than two, two other ones, or one other one. I suggest seven, okay? You need to keep 14 manometers on your truck, so that way in all times, you can line them up and test them to each other. Next thing is gas leak detectors or combustible leak detectors. Do you move a lot of combustible leak detectors? Yeah, we do. They're pretty simple devices. Most of them are pretty simple. They're fairly inexpensive, and they're handy because they can detect the actual gas compound rather than detecting the smell because a lot of people, I smell gas. Well, actually, you don't smell gas. Typically, you're smelling the odorant that was added to the gas. That's not a definitive detection that there is a gas leak there. One of the organizations I work with is the Building Performance Institute, and they have a standard on how to inspect a residential home for performance and safety called BPI 1200. And in that standard, in a recent edition, the last couple of years, they've actually required that you use a measurement quality, a measurement level 
gas leak detector, they can actually tell you the concentration in percent LEL, percent of the lower explosive limit for the gas leak, because it's a standard and it's required to practice work underneath that standard by the authority that tells you you do. We've seen some movement of those. And it's the kind of product that is fairly easy to use, but you do have to follow certain steps to use it. Would you mind naming some of the products that actually show that level? Because that isn't something that I was even aware of. So I think some might be interested in looking those up. Sure. And actually, there's one company in Valparaiso, Indiana called Sensit or Sensit Gas Technologies, I believe. They've been 40 years doing business in the U.S. They make the most affordable gas leak detector that has a measurement basis on it. You can get others that are in the $1,700, $2,000 range, but theirs is around $450, bucks, 480 bucks for, it's called the Sensit HXG2D. And actually, it was developed for another reason. It was developed because there was some safety issues, we'll say, with the installation of natural gas. I don't want to get too specific here, but it was a new, it was a large a commercial building where they had put in black pipe to run the gas and they had failed to detect the presence of the gas by odor because the black pipe actually absorbed the odorant. So there was a loss of property and life associated with that. And it stimulated a standard whereby this kind of product allowed you at a fairly inexpensive point to really detect if there was gas there or not and be able to measure it. Yeah. And from a consumer standpoint, from somebody who doesn't know much about this industry, it seems fairly obvious that we would be checking for leaks of explosive gases. That only kind of makes sense. And actually, when I was early in the trade, because I live and work in a market where there just isn't that much gas. When I first started hearing about combustion analysis and all this, that's what I assumed it was. I assumed, well, you're just checking to see if there's unspent gas. And it does make sense that that's something that we check for. I see very few technicians in our market who have combustible gas leak detectors. What are some of the calibration recommended processes of making sure that it is working and or sending it in for calibration? Most of them aren't calibratable. In fact, one, the actually one I participate in the design team on, the Backrack Leakator 10, there actually is a scaling resistor that comes with every new sensor, which sort of fine tunes the sensor, the analog measurement aspect of the product, I mean, analog electrical, to the sensor that you get. Otherwise, any other replacement sensor is just kind of scaled within a range. And most of the time, the way you use these is sort of like a Geiger counter. If anyone's familiar with that, you just look to see if there's more signal detected here and less over there. And many of them allow you to rescale like the Backrack Leakator Jr. You can actually touch a button and it rescales and it sort of drops the sensitivity as you move closer to the, if you can imagine like the cloud source of gas, that you're at the fringes of the cloud, you need to have the highest sensitivity. You find out as you move closer, you get the, it starts to go into a high detection rate, either the lights or the beeper on it goes off. Then you need to dampen down the sensitivity as you move closer and closer to the highest concentration of the leak. And that's you know, like on the many of the products, you can either use a thumb wheel or a button or some kind of scaling step to tune your sensitivity as you move closer to the leak. Yeah. So I think this is for those of us who do electronic leak detection, we're used to this process for refrigerant leak detection. It's the same basic thing. You kind of keep re-zeroing as you get closer and closer in order to find the source of the leak. You're not necessarily seeing an exact parts per million reading. You just know that as you get closer, it's sort of like playing the Marco Polo, basically. <laughs> as you get closer, you hear that it's getting closer and closer and you just keep sort of re-zeroing and they don't necessarily all have that technology. But then on the other side, you have a leak detector like the PGMIR, by Bacharach, it gives you a number. This is what the concentration of this particular refrigerant is. And that's more like that sensor that you were talking about. Absolutely. Perfect analogy to uh, AC to heating. Yep. You're looking for the concentration of the substance. The one thing you do need to be aware of is sort of background cross interference, other things that the sensor may pick up in addition to the thing that you're trying to sense. So things like pipe dope and other things can be distracting to the sensor and show as a false signal. It doesn't mean it's bad. It may just mean that you aren't able to resolve it. You just have to be aware of it. And then checking around fittings, joints, valves, things like that. The other interesting anecdote is I was on a gas appliance manufacturers association committee and Gamma actually moved into what's called the AHRI, Air Conditioning Heating Refrigeration Institute. I was on a committee and we were discussing measurement protocols with combustible gas leak detectors around gas valves. Gas valves are actually allowed to dribble or leak a little bit by the standard because you need to make something that's fairly inexpensive and a piece of equipment that is triggered by the available energy you have there, electrical or whatever, 
to release the gas, to light up your furnace, your water heater. So there's actually levels that are allowed, just like heat exchangers are technically allowed to have some breach to them in the manufacturing process because it's hard to make these you know, a valve hermetically seal or a heat exchanger hermetically seal. Sort of similar then to the manometer in that with a gas leak detector, you're really just using common sense. They tend to be fairly accurate. In the case of the gas leak detector, the majority of them, you're just measuring here to there, not an absolute number. And so you start to check it against another device when you begin to suspect that it's not doing the job that it's supposed to do. Basically strike up a lighter without any or a gas stove or something like that. Don't drench it in the gas, but you want to see that it's still sensitive, that it's still able to pick up. So next thing that I want to talk about, we talked a little bit about this in the podcast that I did with Jim, and it was not a product that I was very familiar with. And he talked about draft gauge, a draft gauge for measuring in the combustion air zone, for measuring pressure differential. And so now we're getting into that sort of Pascal range. We talked a little bit about manometers earlier as it relates to measuring gas pressure, but now let's talk about measuring those really fine differences in pressure. You want to make sure that, and this would be for atmospherically vented systems, for the majority of it, you want to make sure that you do have draft to pull the effluent, the byproducts of combustion out of the structure, out of the mechanical room, if you will. Draft gauges, there are some from Backrec, I think actually they still might be producing them that use uh, mechanical flappers or vanes in them to tell you which direction a draft is moving. I think the one he might have referred to was the Dwyer 460. It's got a ball that's in the airstream. So as the air is pulled through, the ball rises at a certain point in this tube, in this little tunnel, to tell you the amount of draft that's being pulled. And it's a quick check. It's an inexpensive thing to tell that you do have sufficient draft for the manufacturer's standards, for the installation, for the heating appliance you're looking at. So from a more accurate standpoint, though, say if you were doing just a pressure test for the combustion air zone to ensure that you weren't going to backdraft, maybe you would use, because he was suggesting using that Dwyer draft gauge for that purpose. Do you agree with that or would you go with a more precise manometer? I'd have to take a second look at the product. It's hard to disagree with Jim Bergman. <laughs> okay. I think, again, this is going back to my original dialogue there at the beginning was it's always a learning process. Got it. Okay. And so there are some manometers on the market, though, that have precisions that are beyond what you would typically see for a gas measuring manometer, right? Sure. And generally speaking, those are the ones that do home performance diagnostics, like the manometers that hook up to the blower doors, duct leakage testers, or things you might find that are precision manometers that you'd be using with a pitot tube for low velocity applications. So what you're usually looking for there is we call like Pascal resolution, Pascal being a one two hundred and fiftieth of an inch of water column. So you're looking for Pascal resolution manometers and sometimes with uh, accuracies of like a quarter Pascal to be able to tell these fine differences in pressure, which are important to building diagnostics to determining how much CFM leakage that a building shell has, but they can also be very helpful in determining if you have pressures created by the combustion air zone that are going to perhaps lead to reversals of the atmospheric venting systems. And so in some of these more precise manometers, we're not going to talk a lot about blower doors or things like that, but when you get to the more precision devices, those are the ones that you are going to tend to send back for uh, periodic calibration, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. If you're going to maintain that quarter Pascal resolution, and then they also have uh, built into them the ones used for those kind of products. Again, we're sort of drifting away from combustion, but they have built in cross-checking valves that little solenoids that will actually shunt the sensor to itself so that it can be zeroed out electronically, digitally. So that's how they can maintain that very high resolution and, and high performance through an additional mechanical element within the product. That's what makes them expensive, but that's the cost of precision. Got it. And for most of what we're doing with combustion, it's not necessary with the one exception being if you're trying to measure for small pressure differences that exist in that combustion air zone. So if I could just get a second of your time to talk to you about my friends over at Refrigeration Technologies, as I have many, many times before, and I want to give you a guilt trip. So the guilt trip goes like this. Why are you buying stuff that's not made by Refrigeration Technologies? Why? They make it here in America. The guys come from the trade. They're good guys. They make quality products. If you're buying leak reactant, soap bubbles, that is not Big Blue, why? Why? Why are you doing that? Why are you buying cleaners that aren't Viper cleaners? They're great cleaners. You'll like them. They do a great job. The pan and drain spray is excellent. 
why aren't you using Nylog? Nylog is a really good product. It helps you pull deeper vacuums by lubricating the threads and seals on your vacuum hoses. Hopefully you're using vacuum rated hoses like we've talked about. True Blue, those are great products made by AccuTools. That's a side note. If you haven't looked at Refrigeration Technologies products, then go to refrigtech.com or go to truetechtools.com and type in Refrigeration Technologies if you wish. Either way is fine. And have a look at everything that they offer. Another product that they make that's a really nice product is called Wet Rag. It helps protect critical system components from overheating. They also make a spray gel, which is great for you can be coating, say, a wall, for example. Let's say you're working next to a wall. Well, you would spray a little bit of that gel, that cooling gel, on the wall and then wipe it off when you're done. Of course, don't do it if it's like a painted surface someone's going to see and without testing it first. You know that. You're an adult. But it's good products, very good stuff. And you can find it, like I said, truetechtools.com or by going to refrigetech.com. All right, here we go. Back to Bill. Okay, so the next thing that I want to talk about is the personal carbon monoxide monitor, which again, I think is a pretty underutilized tool. It's an important tool. I'll let you just kind of riff on that a little bit. So a personal CO monitor is something that you can carry on your body, your tool bag, your jacket, set up in your workspace. And that's actually if you're talking about the BPI 1200 standard, that's actually a great thing. Even if you're not doing any BPI work, it's just a lot of the best minds in the country got together to figure out the best protocols for doing uh, testing of combustion systems, for testing of house structures, things like that. It's a free download. Just go ahead, get it, skim through it. You might learn something. Personal CO monitors are called out in there because over the years of experience with BPI, there's been incidences where people have walked in and BPI is really uh, started out from the weatherization industry, but has now moved into the commercial home performance. By commercial, I mean consumer home performance, not always program related. But there are incidences where people, weatherization contractors, would walk into a residence and there would be high levels of carbon monoxide present because going back to people in weatherization, they're using a lot of their income for other things and they can't maintain their heating systems or their houses. So that personal monitor will keep you always aware of your surroundings. And carbon monoxide is, I'm sure has heard this before, but it's invisible, odorless, tasteless, not detectable by any human senses, and it's a cumulative to poison. So it's got this double whammy effect that it builds up in your system and you can't tell it's happening, except perhaps from the after effects that you're experiencing. So a personal CL monitor, we sell them at TrueTech anywhere from the McCurco CM1 to the Sensit P100. We're looking at bringing on another line of product because there's a lot of variety out there. They're sitting there always on the industrial versions of these. Also, there's a Testo 317.3 and a Fluke CO220. Some of them actually avoid the term personal CO monitor because that has the connotation of being a personal safety device, and they're not designed for that. Some of them are called ambient CO monitors, so that's something to watch out for. Others are called personal CO monitors, and they've been tested to standards like the UL 913 standard and other personal safety standards to comply with OSHA regulations such that they can be relied upon for personal safety and do things like give you alarm lights, buzzers, vibrating features and factors, and also last for a very long time in uh, rugged environments or environments where they need to be rugged things like gas utility work, firefighters, other type of work where there's a lot of stress put on the product and they have to perform. So do they generally have like an expected life where you get to a certain point and then you just toss them out and get another one? Or how do you work with them from a calibration or accuracy standpoint? That's pretty much it. They're designed to do a good job for their lifetime. The Sensit brand actually has two, three, and four-year warranty products, and we sell mainly the two and the four-year ones. They're just designed to last with their battery and their sensor for a certain amount of time. They're meant to be economical, between $1 and $200, so that people will actually get out there and use them. And if you build out factors like calibration from them, and also sort of the hassle of having it to ship it around and do calibration, they do become disposable devices. And that was something actually pioneered in the early 90s, I believe. Before that, they were all calibratable devices. They were all four gas sensors. And then somebody, I remember his first name, but not his last name, Cody at uh, BW Technologies, got the idea to make it like cell phones, make it so that they're very lightweight, high volume, and sort of started this whole industry of personal monitors, CO being the largest one, but they're also made for industrial uses for oxygen depletion, hydrogen sulfide, which you encounter in like oil fields and things like that, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, other industrial gases, ammonia included. 
there's a huge industry around personal monitors, and I think it's just starting to touch HVAC. It's just really a great idea to have one with you because you're working around places where carbon monoxide can build up and impair you or the clients you're working with. So one of the best examples of this that I've run into is Gary Reeker, who's an educator. He contributes to the HVAC school group all the time. So you'll see him around. He's always sharing great links and resources. He wears one of these essentially everywhere he goes, as far as I know. I don't know that he's still doing it, but he did it for quite some time. And he would walk into commercial buildings, sometimes a restaurant or whatever, and he would have it go off on him just doing that. And it makes you realize that there's a lot of cases where there may be carbon monoxide present we're just not aware of it. And maybe people are getting headaches or symptoms and then they don't know what the cause is. And it's another great use there is, is you can actually sort of be a, a public safety advocate wherever you go when you're wearing one of these things. Right, right. I carry one with me all the time too when I travel. I, I think it'd be very, very bad PR if I were to die by carbon monoxide. <laughs> You'd have some splaining to do in that case, <laughs> posthumously, of course. Actually, you know what you could do is you could make a whole set of videos in case you ever die by these. And so like, if I die by carbon monoxide poisoning, watch this video and it can be a long apology to your fans. The last but not least topic that we want to talk about here is the combustion analysis. And so this is its whole own deal. So let's start with some of the technologies. Obviously, this is a topic you know a lot about, but talk a little bit about how it's evolved and where we stand today on combustion analysis uh, instrumentation. Sure. Real quick about the evolution. It started out really with what's called Firites, F-Y-R-I-T-E. Uh, it's a product developed by Backrack that was basically taking laboratory chemistry and putting it into a portable device that could be taken in the field. And there was an engineer that worked on that at Backrack by the name of Charlie Crochelle. He since uh, long passed on, but he was a great inspiration and educator and leader and mentor for me in understanding that, that kind of thing because he actually worked on some of the first ones that were done for oil heating systems to tune up oil heating systems. From those wet chemicals, which are actually still made today, you can still buy those systems today. They just give like the, I call them slow speed snapshots of information. With digital sensors that are used now, you can actually get streaming information. It's more like a video of the combustion process when it's under operation. So uh, combustion is a chemical process. It's rapid oxidation of the fuel, the chemical in the fuel, whether it's methane, propane, ethane, butane. But for HVAC, we're mainly talking about substantially methane is the chemical involved. Rapidly combining it with oxygen and then creating byproducts of combustion. So a combustion analyzer monitors what happens after combustion. It takes a reading of temperature, oxygen, and usually CO. There are fewer and fewer products out there that do not include a CO sensor in them. I think it's because of the cost of sensors and just the more pervasive understanding that carbon monoxide is an important thing to measure. From the oxygen in the temperature parameters, and if you tell the instrument, the combustion analyzer, what the fuel is that you're using, it can then go into some lookup tables and give you the combustion efficiency, the amount of excess air, and calculate the amount of CO2. So it doesn't actually measure CO2, it measures oxygen, temperature, and with the fuel-based equations can tell you the amount of CO2 that's being produced, carbon dioxide. And the interesting thing is the goal of combustion is to create lots of CO2 because that means you're burning to completion. If you don't burn to completion, you sort of stop halfway and you only get to CO. I mean, in the simplest sense, it's more complicated than that in a chemical sense, but the creation of carbon monoxide indicates insufficient, incomplete, improper, or poor combustion. So that's one of the reasons why you want to measure CO in addition to its safety aspect is it's an indicator of combustion not going to completion somewhere in your process. I'm going to say a fancy word because I like how it sounds. And so the word that I've heard guys like you say is stoichiometric combustion. I love it. Stoic. <laughs> stoichiometric combustion. My understanding of that is, is the idea of achieving perfect combustion where you have the perfect mixture of oxygen and fuel and so that you only get safe byproducts versus producing carbon dioxide. Is that actually true or am I just making that up? You're right on. So it's the stoichiometric point is like the point of ideal chemical balance. It's where you're creating, you've taken the fuel, the hydrocarbon fuel, and you're converting it into water and carbon dioxide, CO2, and of course, releasing energy in the process, heat. And because things don't happen perfectly, you need to provide excess air. And that's what the oxygen sensor in your combustion analyzer is actually measuring is the amount of excess air that's present. And then doing all kinds of 
reliable inferences back to how the combustion is performing with excess air calculations, CO2 calculations, efficiency calculations. Something that should be noted is through my experience at BACREC and Testo, I learned of all the things that are done in Europe in terms of having standards for combustion analyzers and combustion analysis. And I actually, during my time at Testo, took part in helping to found a committee that's now housed within AHRI that has developed the first United States standard for combustion analyzers. And it's called AHRI, which is the Air Conditioning, Heating, Refrigeration Institute, 1260-1260. So that's a standard that was released, I believe, in January of 17. And it's now going through the process of looking for manufacturers to align with it. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe Blue Flame, the AccuTools analyzer, has stated their alignment with that standard in every aspect of it. And I actually just saw a press release from Backrack, who was also a committee member, that their combustion analyzers align with the AHRI 1260 standard. I believe it's a free download. It sort of gives you an idea of the inner workings. Um, right now, it's a voluntary compliance because no one's calling out that standard, but there now is a standard for that. And I think that will help equipment manufacturers perhaps point to more and more use of combustion analyzers to monitor, diagnose, and set up their products. I think they're looking for sort of an independent third party to say, yeah, this is the way it should be done versus just go out and use a combustion analyzer because that, again, gets into the choice aspect. If I'm reading between the lines here, there's two things that I'm reading between the lines. One is, is that maybe equipment manufacturers haven't been as diligent as they could be with including combustion analysis as part of the setup procedures and maybe not making it easy for that to be part of the process. At least that's been my experience. Would you say that that's true? Yeah, I, th I think they've been hesitant to say, just go out and do it without saying, go out and do it in this manner or with this kind of equipment that meets this kind of standard. This is going to help the industry out. It'll help both the combustion analyzer industry. It'll help out the equipment installers and the technicians and the consumers to getting something more consistent. Standards are important. And then the other side, is it safe to say that maybe some manufacturers of combustion analyzers haven't all been consistent with one another and how the combustion analyzers work or in their internal functions? I think it kind of goes back to something Jim Bergman and I have talked about a lot is that there aren't many standards for performance. And I'm not accusing any manufacturers here, preface by saying that. You can sort of stay whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. You can put down whatever you want in specification. If you don't state the standards or the conditions under which you're achieving those values and there's no consistency to that, then it's hard to make comparisons. If someone says, I'm accurate to within plus or minus 5% on my carbon monoxide reading, does that mean it's at uh, 25 degrees Celsius with where you took your testing? Does that mean that includes the addition of a NOx sensor, which we should talk about next, in your reading to achieve it? What kind of flue gas were you actually exposing it to when you determined that it was in plus or minus 5%? Was it just test gas or was it actually flue gas that you were using or simulated flue gas? So you start to peel back the onion and get into these layers, these nuances. And I think it's that kind of thing where the equipment manufacturers really wanted to see something put out there so that they could point to products versus saying these brands say equipment that is maintained to these standards can be used. Well, I'll, I'll use an example again from air conditioning because that's where I'm more comfortable that kind of points this out. There's a lot of manufacturers who are saying that their uh, core remover tools are vacuum rated core remover tools, but they don't necessarily all measure in the same way or to the same standard. So that makes it really difficult to know what that means. It's not to say that it's not true. It's just what does that mean? Because there's not necessarily a standard that everybody's following. So I think it's maybe sort of the same thing here where you can make statements of accuracy or application, but without there being a standard to measure to, it's, it's really hard to know. And I'll go back into the topic I just mentioned briefly there, uh, nitric oxide filters. Quick story around that. I was working with Testo and I received a frantic phone call from one of the sales managers that in a comparison of a Testo combustion analyzer to another brand by a large client, this Testo was reading low or almost no carbon monoxide, whereas the other analyzer was reading levels of carbon monoxide. It turned out to be that the Testo had built into it a filter for nitric oxide. So there's a lot of nitrogen in air, 79% nitrogen in air. And as a result, in most combustion systems, the oxygen in the air and the nitrogen in the air in the flame front and from other sources will combine to create nitric oxide or NO gas. Nitric oxide gas, when you face it to a carbon monoxide sensor, shows up in proportion 
to the amount of nitric oxide as part of the carbon monoxide signal, if you will. So if you have, say, zero parts per million CO and 100 parts per million nitric oxide, it'll look on the sensor like it's 50 ppm CO when there's actually no CO present at all. That's what was happening with this large client. We figured out, went ahead and took the filter, the NOx filter out of the Testo. It read the same as the competitor, but that's only because you were disabling the Testo. So low readings don't always mean crippled products or insufficient products out there. And in fact, it was sort of this understanding of this, and I'm going to take credit for my persistence along with other people saying that this had to be part of that BPI 1200 standard, that you do have to use a NOx filter in order to give the correct readings. It's fairly easy to give correct readings, but again, you have to know what to ask for in a combustion analyzer. Not all the brands in the market have it or build it in, so it's something you need to ask for if you're going to rely on that CO level to make determinations of consequence, not safety necessarily, but determinations of consequence for your customer or for yourself. And one of the biggest considerations is just like what you said, that a technician in the field has to be able to trust their tools. And if they don't understand what may be interfering with their tool, then they're going to tend to just disregard the measurement completely. And so either they're going to stop taking it or they may continue taking it and just write down whatever they want, as opposed to the reality, because they start to not believe that what they're getting is truthful. So it's really critical that a tech understands what could be impacting their measurements so that way they can make the appropriate adjustments, even if it's only mentally. Or they might get on Facebook and say, this piece of whatever sucks because it, I compared it to my other one, my buddy's other one, and it gave a lower reading. Well, don't always go down that path. All right. So there are many different combustion analyzers on the market. I mean, a huge range. And obviously none of them are cheap tools. They're an investment no matter what. What factors would you use in order to help you make a decision on which combustion analyzer to choose? I would say if you should look for this NOx filter or look to add it, because if you do want to get CO readings, you want to get good CO readings, reliable ones. Be trust in your product and be able to trust in your results and have your customers trust you. Second thing I would say is, are you a data junkie? And are you the kind of data junkie that likes information in front of you in your hand on the display of the meter? Or is it okay to transmit information to an app and to have the ability to work with it in sort of the app ecosystem? Pretty much those are the main factors right now. For the HVAC building performance industry, we could get into combustion analysis on the industrial side, but I'm not going to move into that aspect right here for our conversation because of the nature of our audience. So things like a color display, the ability to show graphics on the display, if you're a data junkie. If you're not, go with a simpler presentation of the information. Look for uh, serviceability and access to service. And by that, I mean both self-service because a lot of companies sell parts and usually people using these products are taking apart and reassembling all kinds of electronic and digital equipment all day long for their customers. You can also self-service your own product. Calibration, on the other hand, is a different aspect. So you need to find something that's easily calibratable. And usually that's a third party that you would involve in calibration because of the handling of toxic gases, the valves, the cylinders, the kind of the stable environment and control. I think it's a better investment to send it off to someone for calibration, whether it be the manufacturer or we do it at TrueTech also, than to set up on your own. Unless you have a service fleet of 20, 30 analyzers, you might want to train someone to be your dedicated in-house calibration, in which case you can buy the equipment to do that. It could make sense. I guess I'm saying Knox filter first, and then it's a decision based upon data. The next aspect would be to look for products in alignment with this 1260 standard. I think that's something that's going to be coming along, and it may become a request from certain clients or maybe come across from manufacturers, but the crystal ball is not clear in that one. It could be two, five years out, whatever. Yeah. So finding something that's in compliance with this standard is just kind of insurance that you're forward compatible, that you're not going to end up with a tool or device that's going to be off kilter with what the industry has, which makes it a lot easier, especially if you do have a fleet, if you're more than a one man show and you've got a bunch of these out there, it's much easier if they all function in much the same way. Right. And I did say that Beckrick announced it, Blue Flames got it, Testo was on the committee, so I'd say it's a slam dunk, they'll have it, they may not have announced it yet, and then Kane USA, which is UEI, was on the committee, so I think that they spent all that time in the committee, they're definitely going to put it into their product, so it just hasn't been announced yet. This is really sort of like late-breaking information here in December 2018. 
Indeed. Okay, so from a calibration standpoint, though, is it pretty much standard to do that once yearly? Is that typical? That's pretty much annual calibrations are recommended. And in fact, some groups like ResNet, the Residential Energy Rating Network, they actually audit their auditors' <laughs> details and make sure that their calibration records are kept in compliance with what the manufacturers request. So annual calibration, ours is around just a little bit over 100 bucks, And they also can help detect things that are going to be breaking down in the investment in your analyzer too. And when we talk about products that are in use for our audience, they range from around $600, a lot of them around the $1,000 point. And then there's different accessories like printers that you can get with them, other types of probes that allow you to enhance what you're using there. Good stuff. Yeah. A lot of resources available at truetechtools.com, T-R-U-TechTools.com. Like I mentioned before, offer code get schooled is valid for a lot of products. If you find something that the code doesn't seem to be working, then I would say just reach out to the contact and they can figure out how to make that connection there. Because most of the products out there, there is some kind of discount if you have an affiliation through us here on the podcast. Anything else you want to add? Any closing thoughts? I think combustion analysis is necessary. You're going to discover and find things. I see, I think it was probably as a result of Jim's latest podcast, people have come back around and say, well, I really don't need to do it, or it's not the kind of thing that makes a difference. But then there's a whole parade of people that will come in behind, real technicians, real applications, and say, this made a difference for safety for my client. This made a difference for fuel consumption for my client. This made a difference for equipment longevity. There's just so many factors. The other quick Hop off point here is something that you actually covered recently in the HVCR school. Your blogs or your tech tips was about heat exchanger testing and combustion analyzers absolutely are appropriate to do one type of heat exchanger, cracked heat exchanger evaluation. And that's for looking for a change in the gases where they're not supposed to be. You're looking for when you turn the distribution air fan on, if that communicates with the vent system, with the combustion system, it shouldn't be because there should be a seal or the heat exchanger contains the combustion products. It's supposed to transfer the heat, but not any of the gases. So if you get a gas exchanger instead of a heat exchanger, you could pick up the change from the distribution air, pumping air into that system and changing the oxygen or the carbon monoxide levels, and thus giving you the idea that there could be a breach in the heat exchanger. So there's processes to do that. Actually, if you go back to True Tech Tools and look for our combustion applications guide, which actually Jim Bergman wrote and I edited years ago, there's still a lot of valid information there for evaluating heat exchangers. And again, look for Brian's blog post tech topic there that gives a nice overview of it too. All right, there we go. So yeah, thank you so much, Bill. Another reminder, listen to the Building HVAC Science Podcast. You can find it on all of your podcatchers out there, whether it's the Apple Podcast app or whether it's Stitcher on a Android device, or you can go to bluecollarroots.com and listen right there. As always, I appreciate you, Bill. Thank you for all you do for the industry. Thank you for all you have done for me in my career. I honestly would not be in this position if it wasn't for so much kind help that you've given. So keep doing what you're doing, and I hope we can talk again soon. Back at you, buddy. Thank you. Take care, everyone. All right. The HVAC School Podcast. That's what you've just listened to. I just want to say again, I've said it before, but it bears repeating that you have all made my life better. Hopefully, I've been able to give you something of benefit here and there, myself and the people who spend the time doing this. But it's been such an honor getting to know so many of you. I was at another conference the other day. I'm not really a traveling man. As you know, I have many children, and so I don't like to be gone too often. But I was at a conference again the other day, and there were CEOs, executives, who were sitting up and listening when I was talking about how the field needs more respect, how manufacturers need to invest more in the field and technical training and all that. And it's such an honor to be able to, I don't want to say speak truth to power. I mean, that's kind of a fancy way of saying it, but to be able to be a positive influence on the trade. And the only reason that that happens is because some of you encouraged me early on. I, many of you did. And all of you who continue to listen and better yourselves and share it with other people and stay excited about the business that we work in. That's pretty darn cool. And I'm proud to know you, proud to work in this trade. It's a good thing. Thank you so much for your part in that. On another note, though, I have a friend who works in a, there's a juxtaposition to HVAC. I have a friend who works in the shoe recycling business. I mean, my goodness, that is a soul crushing business. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. We will talk to you next time on the HVAC School Podcast.
Thanks for listening to the HVAC School Podcast. You can find more great HVACR education material and subscribe to our short daily tech tips by going to HVACRschool.com. If you enjoy the podcast, would you mind hopping on iTunes or the podcast app and leave us a review? We would really appreciate it. See you next week on the HVAC School Podcast.